I mean, any project should have one of three things. It should either have, uh, you know, money, contacts, or portfolio value, I suppose. And you should have at least two of those to make it worthwhile. Episode 73. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week, I'm sitting in the RABA with Magnus Strom, who is the director and founder of Strom Architects. Um, based down on the south coast of the UK. And Magnus's practice really do like a beautiful array of uh, private homes. And in this interview, Magnus gives a very sort of clear Scandinavian flavoured approach to the way they systematically produce consistently beautiful and profitable work. And it was a real delight talking to Magnus because he's very um, business minded. Um, he's worked with business mentors. They have a very unique and interesting way of client acquisition using things like Pinterest and Instagram. And they He's been very efficient in the way that they've developed their working practices and internal systems um, to make sure that they're that they've really gone deep into their residential niche. So Magnus is a originally founded. Strom Architects in 2010 um, and he's responsible for developing the vision of the practice and leading the design projects. So and he works with a very talented team. So sit back, relax and enjoy Magnus Strom. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work, but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself. We can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of. And I'd also love to hear more about your business, and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020. So there's no charge or any obligation with this call, just simply to find out how our content has been of value. And if we get that far and with your permission, of course, what might be next? What what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15 minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK discovery call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Magnus, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. Absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, we're sitting in the Reba Cafe on, uh, on Portland Place at the moment, um, just enjoying some sparkling water and we're having a nice discussion about how you've set up your, your business, um, Strom Architects, you're based in, in Leamington. Um, you've been going since about 2008? 2010. 2010, okay, so n nearly, 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 a, 10 years. nearly a decade of practice. And you've got quite a beautiful portfolio of work. Like you've got one of these Instagrams, which is kind of just juicy, filled with juicy, beautiful images of like new build houses and some really quite ex exquisitely detailed work. Um, so first question then, how, how did you begin how I began, I mean, I don't know, growing up in Sweden, I had two frustrated uh, architects as parents. So they weren't architects, they were I suppose they wanted to be at some point in their lives. So I always grown up with design around me, and I think growing up in Sweden with where functionalism, as modernism was called, there was always around you. So there was mm. always something I was interested in. I wanted to be an architect as long as I could remember. And then you came to the UK when you were... Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I, I couldn't get into School of Architecture in Sweden because my grades weren't good enough. So in '95, Sweden became members of the European Union and I took the opportunity to come and study in Britain. And you ended up in Portsmouth? Ended up in Portsmouth. Uh, I did both my uh, degree and diploma there and I think there was a couple of years there that was a real golden period with some fantastic tutors at mm. the time there. And, and then how did your career begin then? Or how did you make this? Because you were working pre for a, pre a practice previously before setting up on your own. Yes, yeah, so I was, I was working at a, a practice uh, down in Limiting where I am now. 
um, and I was a director there in the latter years. And then when the recession hit 2008, 2009, I think I started to question a lot what I was doing and what my ambitions were. And I think I had become comfortable. Mm. So it, it came a point where I was ready to make a jump and, and start up on my own. It's quite interesting that period of time, 2008, during the recession, has given birth to so many interesting architectural practices over the last 10 years. Um, what were the sort of obstacles when you first set up on your own? Did you, did you go it alone or was there... No, it was all on my own and I, I, I don't think I wanted to do it on my own, yeah. but that's, that's the way it happened. Um, and it's always hard to start because you don't have enough money saved and you don't have any work and... Uh, and it's a big leap of faith. What? I had six thousand pounds in the bank, and I was working from my home when I started. Right, the okay. promise of a job. And was that enough? <laughs> it was enough. <laughs> the way it turned out, you know, I had very low overheads, and I didn't have that many expectations. But I was very fortunate to have a project I had worked on in my previous practice, and the technical design stage and construction stages were subcontracted to me, so I could see the project out, and we shared a, a copyright in the project. So it's, it kind of became a little, bit, a little bit of a, a springboard, as opposed to to other work. And how did you, yeah, so how, how from that initial project, how did the new, new projects begin to develop and how did you begin to find your kind of identity as a business? Um, I was always interested in doing houses because I was doing my previous practice. It's something I found very, very satisfying as, 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 as architecture. And back in, I suppose, then 2010, um, is where digital media press really started to happen and all these magazines like the zine came about and they were so hungry for stuff to publish going from an architecture magazine when they used to publish things you know a couple of products a month now they had a couple of pro a couple of products a day mm. so i think the key for me to that was really good cgi and hiring the best cgi people i had ever seen to create uh, some cgi some products i was working on and that meant that you could actually build a virtual portfolio almost ah that's that's quite interesting so in the early days, before you actually had any completed projects, you yeah. were going quite, you were being quite active in using virtual representations of your work and putting them out into the media. Absolutely, because the, the photo quality renders you could start getting out by them was fantastic. Mm. So that made a huge difference, I think. And what kind of work did you initially start doing? Um, I was always quite uh, selective, I think, in the work I wanted to do. I didn't want to get stuck doing extensions. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to focus on new build houses, uh, and that was what we focused on. And what we really, so we stayed small, you know, we're still small. And rather than grow and take on work we didn't want, we were very selective about the work we took on. How would you? How were you qualifying work? What was the sort of criteria? Um, well, I mean, any project should have one of three things. It should either have, uh, you know, money contacts a portfolio value I suppose and you should have at least two of those to make it worthwhile yeah um. and, and and so the first kind of uh, projects that you that you well, what, what were the ones that you said no to um, it, it was you know we, we got some you're an architect on in the phone book or on the internet and people call you want to do like garage extensions and uh, loft extensions and, and so on and we tried to keep it at a you know a, a new built house size Mm. And it took it took time, but then you know one of the first projects that we got, we actually got it through a that actually was a recommendation uh, through a client of a client client of a client in the old uh, practice that recommended that they came and worked w with us, and we did a house for them that got us lots and lots of publicity. Right. Okay. And then so f and so from that publicity, you were able to generate more active clients. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And that was shortlisted for the House of the Year and it was on the final shortlist and it won numerous architecture prices and so on. So, it, so it, it's, it's a slow business, I suppose, architecture. Uh, and, uh, but to having that key project, which was a quest for us, it, it, it really helped us to develop um, a, a portfolio and, and um, generate interest. Was it, it was interesting, you were saying earlier about how you decided to kind of be quite focused on your niche like to, to, to sort of maintain doing private houses um, but you might have had a kind of conflict in the beginning of like maybe I should be doing some other kinds of work how did you what was what was that conflict how did you reconcile well, it as an architect I think that we all have a, a social responsibility and we all think about how we're part of shaping society and we have an idea about what the products we should be doing and have a social ad agenda and um, and I, it was always a bit of struggle because it was very hard. It's very hard to get those projects because you always have to have done three of them before 
to be able to do another one. Mm. And we just didn't have that kind of pedigree um, to be able to get the projects. And sometimes we managed to get on some form of a shortlist for an invited competition. We even did a feasibility study for a theatre. You know, it was very interesting. But and then he went out to OGU notice, and we, of course, you know, we didn't even apply. But it came a point where where I thought, you know, I kind of came to peace with the fact that we were more likely to get a 20 million pounds house in LA than to do a 20,000 pounds school extension in Hampshire. Yeah. So I think that to generate that clarity in what we were doing, it really helped us to formulate who we are as a practice and what we do as a practice. And that, that clarity of kind of being able to specialize and understand, and actually knowing what it is that you're, you're very good at, how has that helped in terms of creating a kind of uh, your sort of messaging to, you know, your outbound messaging? Well, I think being niche, I think, is, is a good thing. Um, I've been doing a lot of reading, and we talked earlier about different podcasts and uh, different books and had a period in my life when I did read a lot about business and and uh, people skills or leadership or anything. And it's one book uh, by Seth Godin called Marketing, and he's talking about finding your smallest identifiable market. Mm. And I think that if you don't need to sell to everyone, you need to sell to very few people. You don't need many clients a year. Maybe we need five clients a year. We need five good clients a year. So you're much better off having a really focused approach to what we are doing rather than aim blindly at a lot of people. Hmm. And it's it's quite interesting. With, um, many young architects will, you know, I've done this myself, when first starting out practice, trying to do lots of different things and perhaps having a desire to, you know, I and mean, I always wanted to have my practice like a kind of Jeffrey Bauer type of styled projects out in the tropics. And then I kind of realized that I'm in the middle of East London and that there's not that type of thing around. And then you go and try different, different types of things. Mm. How, um, you know, did you, did you test other things, other projects? And what, what was it? What was it about private residential that was kind of like, actually, this is going to be what's going to work for us? I have always loved private residential from when I was, you know, since I was a kid. I've always been uh, amazed by uh, b buildings and, and be being in houses and, and cool spaces, and also the, but also furniture and so on within it. And it became a really natural thing for us that we wanted to continue that because obviously having worked on that in my previous practice, but also worked on a lot of big and housing schemes, it just didn't excite me very much. Mm -hmm. um, and then to be able to find that that is the niche, that's a niche we could operate in, is where we could actually make some money, where we could get paid. Um, and it was also the area we could excel. And so once you've defined your niche and you're realizing you're beginning to build up a kind of a deeper knowledge of a specialist type of building typology, what, how did you grow your business? Or what kinds of systems did you start putting in place? And you said you were interested in business and human communication, leadership. What were what were the what are the what are the sort of business activities that you've been actively involved in 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 growing the company? Um, in the beginning, when I started the business, I think we dealt with a project on a project by project basis, and we always reinventing the wheel as as we all do in the beginning. But it came a point when we needed to get more organised, and I was desperately trying to get to a point where I could stop being a project architect myself and focus on uh, more of the business development side. So I started to see a mentor about two, three years ago who I actually met at the RBA Guerrilla Tactics uh, right. event uh, years and years ago. And it just helped me to crystallize and think about what was important, where I wanted to go, and how I was going to get there. What, so what was this relationship like with, your, with the business mentor? Um, I, w I would like to say it's a bit like going to counselling, <laughs> um, but um, instead of looking backwards, you're looking forwards, and you very quickly realise that you got your uh, private life and your and your business life, and they're intrinsically linked. Mm. So you got to be able to think about them as as one in a way, because you can't separate them. And so, so if your business got to work for you, and you're an you're a human being, that's part of a, a family with a wife and kids and so on. And what were the sort of things that you were having to reconcile or the, the breakthroughs that you, that you had to have? 
Well, I mean, if I, if I was a single man, I'd probably work twice as hard and spend all the time in the office. But you're not. You, ha you have a, a responsibility to, to other people. And you want to be able to still drive really hard the business because I'm very ambitious, I think, and I know where I want to go. Mm. But you obviously can't spend all hours at it, so you've got to be more tactical about how you do it. So we, we, we worked a lot about, you know, just trying to define what that was. And I think very often you know what it is. You have a complete idea about it, but you need to kind of sit down and talk it through with someone and actually write down, this is a plan, this is how I'm going to get to it. So actually, uh, strategically planning out the life cycle of the business, where it's going to go, or, or planning how to win new types of work, what were the sorts of things that you looked at? Well, you looked at anything about uh, work-life balance, but also like um, you know, I, I had some health issues a, a few years ago, which is all sorted now. Mm -hmm. But it it kind of made you think about wh where your priorities lie, and how you can how you can how you can do things, how you can achieve different things, and how you can actually offload yourself to free up your time to do the valuable stuff. What is it? Where is it that I bring value to the practice? Is it in sitting drawing? Um, or is it sitting doing spreadsheets or is it in sitting doing perhaps a concept design more client liaison trying to get new work and, and so on which is of course is the latter mm. so you found you found actually that your role as being the sort of generator of ideas was the most valuable use of your time yeah much more so than sitting actually trying to produce all the work but you've got to get to a certain critical point before you can afford to set up the business like that you're right yeah. And what was that? What was that critical point? Uh, in terms for us, it was probably about being um, five, six people, right? Yeah. And then that, that enabled you. So, how did you start to sort of system, systemically or systematically start offloading tasks? Because that's very difficult for architects to do. Yeah. I mean, the, the first thing was to try and to stop being a project architect and be responsible from the day-to-day -day running of a project, when when it uh, through technical design and when it goes on site. So I was very fortunate to hire a very experienced architect who had loads of experience in, uh, in one of houses. So he came from a role from another architect's practice where he worked as a technical director and not as a project architect, but he helps all the project architects and assist them in delivering the technical projects to make sure that all that the delivery is smooth and that, that, and that the packages are all going out is completely watertight and extremely detailed. Mm. And what other kinds of systems were you beginning to implement? So there's a lot. So I can hear there's a lot of sort of delivery systems that you started to look at. Yeah. What about some of the administration side of the? Of well, the business? very early on in the business, we um, bought into Archie Office, uh, which of course does all our timekeeping, all our invoicing on an online system. And I think that you start to assemble all the data, and suddenly you build up a database of how much time you're spending on projects and where you're spending the time. Uh, which becomes so valuable when you're pitching for new work. Mm. Um, and as a small practice doing houses, lots of other practices might do a couple of houses a year and they almost kind of accept that it's a loss-making scheme because they like doing the odd house here and there. But we've got to make money from our houses. So we really have now an understanding of how many hours does it take to produce a, a technical design package, how long time does it take, how much time do we need to spend on site, etc. So we have a whole database of, of, of all our information now, so we can go out and, and put a proper fee proposal together, and we know kind of where our line is, where we don't go below, because there's no point doing the project, because I don't want to buy projects, and if it's not the right, then, then we'll, we'll say no thank you. It was, it's interesting, actually, that it's from the ability of being able to uh, be very focused in the types of buildings that you're delivering, you're able to build up that expertise in knowing how much this project's going to cost, and you can be very controlled of that, which actually provides a much better client experience. Yeah. You, were, you were talking as well uh, earlier about how you present the level of service to your clients, because you've got some interesting systems yeah. there in place. Um, being a, a niche practice, you know, we, we kind of perhaps thinking, that, oh, it's nice to diversify and get other income streams. And it's a bit harder when you only work in one small sector. But how can we diversify within that sector, so to speak? So what we have started doing is that we're offering a fee at, at three different uh, tiers. So we're going from a, a good, better and a best. Um, whereas the, um, the the good service is a is a straightforward architect service when we do design 
planning application, we do technical design, and we also do um, the CA on site and so on. But for the technical design, we, we're not going to look at, for example, bathrooms and kitchens and uh, bespoke stuff. But it, it would be like a bathroom layout on a GA drawing. And you go up to a better service, we would look at far more detailed uh, kitchen and uh, bathroom drawings where we do all the kind of fully spec of all of that with all the schedules and all the elevations and tile sets out, et cetera, et cetera. And whereas the, b the best level we would offer um, at developed design, we would offer a, we do a physical model, we would do CGI, we would do interior design concepts and a technical design. We will do, of course, all the full bathrooms and kitchens where we do it all in 3D. Um, so we can whiz around the 3D model with the client and we also um, do interior design, all bespoke fixtures and fittings and help them with furniture selection and blinds and all the loose bits as well. And it's become a, a something that we can of course charge money for mm. and it's become a option that we find that most clients actually want. They want the best service. So it's a win for them and it's a win for us. So it's worked extremely well. And as, as, is, why do you think it, why, why do you think the client always wants the best, the best service rather than the sort of the cheapest level of service? I think it's partly a psychological thing. Yeah. That, of course, I want the best. You know, you buy the M Sport package on your BMW. So, <laughs> <laughs> and and it's a little bit like that. You you kind of package it up, and it becomes cheaper than procuring all the different bits separately. Mm. Um, and I think that the when it comes to the interiors. Um, we don't see the interiors being separated out from the architecture, of course. Um, so, and all our clients, they kind of agree with that. So they really like the idea that we're involved in, in shaping the interiors, being part of a coherent package. It's, it's quite an int I mean, it sounds so obvious in a way, and it's something that we've all got experience with in terms of um, how we consume or how we purchase things. We're all used to seeing different levels of service and you know the uh, BMW is a good example of the different kind of sports packages that you get and the sort of the add-ons and and actually architecture itself lends itself quite nicely to be able to do that and actually we can s it also starts to change our psychology of how we're thinking about expense and price and that actually clients relate to something expensive as being better quality but it needs to be put into that kind of psychological comparator but it's, it's not just about price, it's about, I think it's about selling value again, you know, so we're trying to communicate value. Uh, I have no doubt that we, uh, I know for a fact that we're, we come up, you know, clients speak to other architects, of course, all the time, and we get a feedback that, oh, you're a bit expensive, but I'm trying to communicate that we're selling value. First of all, at the early stages, it's almost like you can't equate it to a fee spent because it's almost like a creative uh, fee. Mm. The creative fee for getting a well-designed house is, is X. It's not the amount of hours you spend on it. It's like, you know, if you go and, you go and buy a, a piece of art or something, it's not just a canvas and the, and the paint and the artist's time you spend. It's actually the intellectual property that's worth something. Yeah. The other really important bit about value is when it comes to technical design. We don't front load our fees particularly much. We have a big chunk of our fee for the technical design. I know lots of people front load the fees because they like to bank the fee early on and so on, but I like to have be able to have the fee where we need it. So we have a big chunk available for the technical design and we do a very te thorough technical design and we do it in a fixed price because if we mess up, we don't want to pass that risk onto the cl uh, that cost onto the client. So, by doing a thorough technical design that might cost more than our competitors, we're also delivering a tender package that is really thorough, that is the same as a construction package. And what that does, it really reduces the construction risk and um, for the client during construction, both in terms of uh, changes, overspend and program. Mm. And that means that we have uh, a construction phase that is a lot smoother. We just finished a project for a structural engineer and he was, we just had a handover meeting the other week and he was saying to us that what he thought was lovely about the process was that the technical design package was so good that during the construction it didn't create any problems. There was no changes, there was no delays, there was anything like that. So it could just be a smooth process throughout the project. And he says, and I see the architect's package all day long. So, I mean, like we got to take pride in that, but that's kind of the value that we're trying to sell and communicate to the client. Because mm. at the end... 
bit a bit more money spent on fee up front is worth a lot in the end when a project cost is actually smaller. And the other thing that we've come to realize is that we've had clients have said, you're too expensive and they've gone away. And then they come back. We have two projects that has happened because they're going to work to another architect and they realize that, oh, crikey, it cost the same to build with these guys, but I just didn't have the right information from the beginning. Mm. So they come back to us and accept that it's worth paying that bit of extra to get the right service. And when you first meet a client, how how do you manifest these conversations with them or or how do you communicate the value so that so obviously you've got you've got the different uh sort of fees fee levels if you like the serv- different service levels um well the first one of the things we did a couple of years ago was that we produced a document which we call um process uh, projects and practice and when you get a when we get a phone inquiry one of the first things to do is send them this document it talks about our practice, who we are, what, what our ethos is, what our approach is. And it's also got a really big section on the process. How, what is the process of building a house? Because most clients have never done this before. They actually don't have any experience. So it takes you through all the different work stages and explains what we do, um, what we're doing for each stage, um, so they can really understand what we do as an architect, because lots of people, I don't think, necessarily understand all the things we do as architects. And then it talks about construction costs, it talks about fees, it talks about sustainability, it talks about program, all of those things. And they can then get a really good idea about everything associated with the project. And then what happens is very often, after a sentence that, we have a follow-up phone call a few days later. Very often it is that it's, it might not be a fit uh, we might not be a fit for the client. It, what happens quite a lot is that there's a lot of um, potential clients that have a budget in mind um, and it's completely unrealistic. So they get a very quick a real, a reality check and then um, it doesn't come anything or we might recommend someone else that can do a, you know, the work on a slightly uh, different kind of projects. Um, or it, very often we also get the response that this is brilliant. This is, and, and now it's just clarified my view that you know we want to work with you, and then we'll we'll have a site meeting from that, and then we follow on from that. And how are you meeting new clients in the first place? So you were saying earlier that you, it's it's not actually referrals that you get a lot of, but you actually find a lot of new yeah. clients. How do we you have we have yeah we have, we have had the odd referral or through contacts, but that's not really how we get our work. And unfortunately, we don't get repeat clients because you build someone a house once and they don't necessarily build another one. Yeah. Um, so I say like the internet is the majority of uh, where we get clients. Um, Instagram and Pinterest. Pinterest is brilliant in that way because people pin your work. People set out on a project to create a Pinterest board and very often they save your images from whether it's from your website or whether it's from, you know, Architizer or, or Arc Daily or the zine. So just ping all these images and then there's, when they're honing in they're starting to think about oh, who's actually done this and they can start to see what the architects are and uh, that way we you know for example we, we pitched for a project in Sweden that way we, we pitched for projects in other parts of the you know it just comes to us that way and it's print the Pinterest works in a funny way without us having to do anything because mm. it works in the background by its own accord and then of course it's uh, Instagram where, which I think is a brilliant forum for architects. I think it's um, a lot better than Twitter. Twitter is full of a lot of angry rants. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I question why I'm on it sometimes, but it's always funny to, to, have, to have it. <laughs> it is. It's a lot of angry rants uh, on Twitter. And architects talking to architects. Um, well, there's that, and there's a lot of you know political stuff, and there's a lot of criticism and stuff you know and I, I think sometimes we, we're so quick to criticize each other's work and uh, you know you got the comment section on the AJ and the zine and you got the angry brigade just like you know slagging other people's work off and you know I think that we don't need to do that because it's, it's actually quite hard to get things built in this country sometimes uh, we have clients we've got budgets we've got building regs we've got planning constraints there's so many different things we have to navigate so I think that, you know, sometimes we should just be a bit more accepting of, of what we do. Yeah, and we, we don't always know what the story is behind each no, house. No, exactly. And when you know what exactly. the story is, then, then yeah. buildings become quite compelling. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so, you so Instagram, um, we're obviously trying to put our work out on Instagram and 
Uh, we think uh, good imagery is very important, whether it's through CGI, which is uh, you know a design process or finished work. Um, and sometimes you have to rehash a little bit. It's hard to find enough um, content to put out there all the time. Mm. So we're thinking very much about now about content creating and how we can start creating more content to share on different platforms. And how are you doing that? What kinds of content are you using? Um, for example, um, we always just started using stories on Instagram. Um, sometimes you go on a site visit and you, 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 know, you just want to keep up to date, update people what you're doing. Um, there's... Um, we are going to start doing little project videos when we finish the project. You can do a 10-minute video. You can put it on Instagram TV or we're going to start putting it on YouTube. So it's just about creating more content and then it all helps about you link it to your website. and you'll, yeah. It's quite interesting that so you were saying that, uh, that you found CGI's have been a very powerful way of marketing and actually making sure. Is there a particular... How, how, what, what, what makes a good CGI, a, a, you know, marketing collateral... What makes a good CGI? I mean, like, if you look in, in the real, in the big CGI world, I have friends who are at the Boundary, um, who are probably one of the best visualizing firms in the world. That's driven by marketing, because you they're doing big um, housing schemes in, in New York or something, and they have a phenomenal marketing budget. So the marketing budget, you've got a whole page at the back of New York Times or the Sunday Times for these uh, these schemes. And that's, so there's a lot of money in there that drives that. Mm. For us as architects, it's um, by enabling us to package it in with our best service, it becomes something that doesn't become a direct cost for us. It just enables us to be able to get product out there like halfway through the process, saying that this we've designed this, this is fresh on the board. And it also shows clients what they're getting. So it helps out with when we're doing an interior design concept as part of, of, of stage three it then actually is in the render. So the clients are actually seeing what they're getting. And I think we pride ourselves on that the CGI's actually look like the, the build, actually finished building looks like the CGI. Very often you see developers, CGI's, and then you've got a building afterwards that looks completely different. Yeah. But you work in a house uh, at the high-end market, you, you want something to, to look exactly the same. So I think we pride ourselves on that. It just um, it means that we've got to know at design stage that what we're designing is actually buildable. And you said you, you we're getting to win work in other countries as well. So you're working, yeah, that's you've right. Working, you've been working in Spain, you've got projects happening in America. So, yes, so we, we are starting to get to work abroad. We have um, just completed a house in Sweden, in Stockholm. Um, such a fabulous place in the archipelago and it's right on the water. And that's pro is a really is a high end house, and we've been working on that since 2016. And it's taken a bit of time to get finished. We uh, have designed another two houses there. Unfortunately, they, they've been sold, um, so they're never going to be built. We just got commissioned to another two houses there, and we're doing another house in South Sweden on the lake, which is currently on site, and we're doing a house in Barcelona, which is also currently on site. And we have a potential project in the States, in Rhode Island. So we've been over there to discuss with the client. They're just trying to get some uh, baseline consents in place before they push a button on it. Yeah. And we have a potential project in New Zealand. Uh, but the market has kind of fallen out of New Zealand. So he's struggling to sell another property to enable him to build on this frontline beach property he's got. And, you've, and you find it quite easy to be able to work collaboratively with clients in different countries i mean in sweden it's worked really well obviously i am swedish it doesn't mean i necessarily know how everything works in sweden all the regs and everything so we just aimed quite high and um and i worked a treat we obviously work with swedish consultants right so we can and it's slightly different there you don't have structural engineers the same as here you have building engineers so they traditionally have a bigger involvement uh, than a structural engineer has here and a bigger responsibility but we still create a full technical design package, but we work closely with them to understand that everything um, was hitting regs and so on. But it, it worked really well. Um, in Spain, it's been a bit more tricky because we did a design up to, to planning and then the client didn't really want to spend you know, fees on a UK architect, so he thought he could use more cheaply in, in Spain, which with hindsight is perhaps not the best idea because I think that there's a slightly different level of technical um, delivery in terms of the information. Mm. 
Um, so we've had done a lot of ad yeah, advising and redlining and just discussing with, with them how to, how to achieve it. And I think with hindsight for projects uh, when it comes to um, delivery, I think we're going to have a much more easier, uh, have an approach where we um, suggest to the client that we do outline drawings um, and critical details and perhaps even work with a UK engineer that we have a relationship with so we can provide them with a, an outline of how the scheme is going to work, how it's going to stand up, how it's going to be detailed. And then the, the, the executive architect actually got a format to work to rather than trying to interpret a building just from design drawings. Um, obviously, we we do our houses all the time, so we, we know how we put them together. We know how we can achieve things. But someone else that doesn't have the understanding is going to do a completely fresh interpretation yeah. from a picture or from a drawing in a way. Uh, and, and that's, of course, much harder for them. It's, it's really interesting, actually. A lot of this, again, it keeps kind of sort of stemming back to the the benefits of going deep into a niche allows you to become very, very sophisticated and just, you know, very seasoned and experienced in being able to deliver something and you can keep refining your, your processes. Um, I wanted to go back a little bit to asking you about your fees and how you structure your fees. So once you've kind of given your client the sort of three options of, yeah. of, of levels of bands, do you then do it as a percentage base, or do you do it as? Um, it, it starts off at a percentage base, right. um, so you know it might be like a eleven, twelve, thirteen percent, something like that, depending on what level it is and and what the budget of the project is. And then we kind of end up with a it goes into a spreadsheet, and we can kind of see what the different levels are, and then we go back and cross check on a similar project how many hours did we actually spend on the technical design, and the thing that always falls away. It's what happens after you've done your technical design and you've got all your negotiations with the tendering or you've got additional time in spending changing a brick. You know, you have to change every single drawing because the brick's changed dimension. <laughs> you know, that's not kind of stuff we want to get involved in. So we want to make sure we nail that from the beginning. But we've got to have an understanding of what typical our, our allowance is to procure something. Um, and of course, whilst we're working on a fixed fee, they are reasons and limitations to what that is. We're trying to define within a fixed fee that we will do X amount of meetings at, at the client's place, particularly if it's far away. Mm. Um, we will do, we always say like at concept design, we always offer one iteration free of charge. If the client hates what we do, we'll redesign it. But it's a concept stage. And because it's a close process with the client, it doesn't really happen because it's not that we design a house and go and present it to them. So it's a process where we're discussing ideas and also they come to us in the first place so hopefully they have they, they have an affinity with what you're doing already mm. so their risk is reduced. And then when you come to develop design you have again one design iteration but that's based on the concept design being signed off so it then becomes a minor change. So we're just trying to within that fixed fee have um, a limit to what we do. And the same thing to a technical design that's based on a signed off of scheme. And if it's any major revisions or iterations, that's of course is subject to, to, a, to a different fee agreement. And how do you structure or how do you maintain in, or in, ensure that you've got good cash flow coming in from projects when you're dealing with things like planning, planning appeals, um, third, waiting for third parties to make decisions on stuff, waiting for clients to make decisions on stuff, or, or sometimes with private residential projects can just sort of suddenly pause. Um, yes, projects can certainly <laughs> can certainly <laughs> pause. There is all sorts of reasons that projects kind of go away and they disappear and they go quiet for a long period of time and then they come back. There's nothing I can do about cash flow during a project like that. That's completely relating and on another project. The, the difficult thing is when they all come back suddenly <laughs> and you think of the resourcing problem is that. Um, um, but uh, we're trying to invoice everything on a monthly basis. Right. <clears throat> so up to the, the first stages, the design stages, it's, um, it's probably more fluid. But when we come to the technical design, we do a very thorough program. We put in all our client review meetings in the program. So we say, and we put in the cash flow uh, drawdown. But we try to identify in these um, in the client review meetings, we're saying that this meeting we're going to discuss this and we're going to make a decision on that. We will give you this homework. 
And then we do the same thing for that one. So in the meet, first meeting, we said, like, we've got to make a fix on facade materials and windows. And then we can, might be like, you've got to make a decision on um, you know, flooring because it affects all the build-ups. So we're trying to structure that throughout the project so the client knows when they, have a make a when they have to make a decision, what decision they have to make, but they get lots of warning about it. And it might be that we, sa we send them to a certain place to look at something or we have lots of samples. And so it's a really structured process to make sure that if we say it's going to take 16 weeks to do a technical design package, if we don't get the sign up from the clients at the right time, it doesn't take 16 weeks. But what we find always is that the client really want to have it happening quickly. Yeah. So by us being able to put it down on paper, all the critical timings where many decisions made, it really helps. And it helps us to focus consultants as well. Because we can say that we need to have a structural concept designed by this. And then we can start doing our GAs based on that. And then we can kind of plonk in and finalize structure a little bit later. But we have to... We can't just say that we're going to issue tender on X date and then expect that the consultant's going to work to our timelines because and it doesn't work like that. And so how do you structure all your processes then? Is it kind of in a document format or...? We use um, a, a called Merlin, Merlin Project or Project Wizard in Merlin. It's a bit like Microsoft uh, Project. <coughs> so it's basically a Gantt chart right. outlining it. And we have a similar Gantt chart for every project in the office that outlines trying to look at the resources we know what's happening at what time. Okay. It's very hard keeping it up to date. That's the hardest thing. Yeah. But um, in a funny way, I think that also just like having a cash flow uh, spreadsheet, it, it works really well as well because you can actually see by how much you're invoicing each month <laughs> what your resourcing is going to be because you know roughly how much each person can invoice a month and because how many hours they work so you know that if you go on months where you've got too much invoice you know you're going to struggle to resource it mm. so this actually there's quite a lot of clearly cut business systems and checklists and procedures that are documented and easily shared amongst within the office y yes i mean like we're still working on it and developing it and right. we're trying to set up a whole new qa system um, because, you know, you, you do a project, you do a mistake, you learn from it. But if you don't write it down, it kind of goes away and you can make the same mistake again. So we've now written checklists for all the different work stages. And it all feeds into our, to our kind of our office and our procedures manual. So we just know how things can happen. And it all helps when something new starts. But it's also about CAD, how we actually draw. Or it could be simple things as tone of voice. In an email, how do we write emails? Right, okay. Because I think all of those things are important. How do we answer the phone? And do you have, do you have kind of... We are we're working on all of those bits at the moment. Yeah. And I, it's going to be finished in a couple of months, we hope. Right. Well, that, well that's, and that's, what's the benefits of having all of that? Well, the benefits is that when you've got someone new starting the business, they understand what is kind of, this is how we do things. It also means that if someone you know, falls ill or someone leaves the practice. He knows that this written down how we do invoicing. If someone doesn't know how to operate a system, you're going to learn from scratch and you're going to be pretty screwed if you don't know how to do your invoicing at the end of the month. So I, I think that the more processes and procedures we write down, the more consistent we are in delivering the same service at all times. Mm. And it's really interesting. It's, it's really nice to hear actually that that process and I can kind of see how as well it kind of relates back to the beginnings of you know how you know you know how much to charge for a project when you've got these kind of systems in place and you can be very consistent with it you're you're able to make sure that you're make, making these houses yeah, profitable. absolutely yeah um going back to just to sort of finish up uh you, the work that you did with your business mentor and uh, you were saying to me earlier that you were one of the biggest things that you got out of it as well was was communication yes <laughs> so can you say a little bit about that well um, i mean as, as i said earlier being swedish um, <laughs> sometimes people think that i can be a bit direct or a bit aloof and whereas the british uh, might be perhaps a little bit uh, i'm terribly sorry but <laughs> have you would you mind to change this where i might just say like oh that's a bit shit can you change that and it's quite easy to rub someone up the wrong way and so i suppose i have to learn to 
not become British, but perhaps to <laughs> moderate what I say. But also, if I say something that's really kind of going to come like a big, you know, sledgehammer blow, I kind of can forewarn someone and say, like, you know what, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, you're probably not going to like this, but however, you know, and to say things in a different way, it really helps. Mm. And I've come to really learn about my facial theater, as she, as she calls it, <laughs> is that, you know, I can come in the office and, and be really grumpy and look really grumpy and affect the whole mood in the office, whereas I can come in with a smile on my face and I can lift the whole atmosphere of the office. And I sometimes forget that and I try to really remind myself of it. You, you bring your personal life into the office, but sometimes you really shouldn't. And uh, and it's hard because it's so we're a small office, we all know each other, we all know each other's partners and so on. So we, we have a kind of, it's, it's a big family in a way. So it's important to think about how we all kind of uh, talk to each other and behave around each other and so on. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15-minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.